to make the measurement first so that you can collapse the wave function and see what state it ends up in. Or maybe that affects like your wave function too, right? Before the exam, then the exam collapses your wave function. <laughs> we see which of the two eigenstates you end up in. Although you can easily end up in a superposition of eigenstates even after the exam. Yeah, that's right. What's that puddle on the floor? Oh, that was you. <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, back to the delta well. So you may recall, and if you don't, I'll remind you, that we are looking at the delta function well. So v of x, we said, was minus alpha delta of x. And so if you plot that, then at x equals 0, the potential whew, shoots down to minus alpha infinity, so to speak. And we found that outside the well, which is basically everywhere except at the origin, the wave function is x p because the, um, the energy, if it's negative, um, is going to need to produce, so we're looking for a bound state here. The, the energy being less than zero said that the wave function would look like on either side of the well, general solution would be something e to the minus kappa x plus something e to the plus kappa x on one side of the well, the e to the plus kappa x has to go away, and on the other side of the well, the e to the minus kappa x has to go away, uh, such that we found that the wave function was, boy, it just inevitably happened. The wave function was a pair of decaying exponentials, v e to the plus kappa x on one side, v e to the minus kappa x on the other side. And then we matched boundary conditions um, on at, at x equals 0. We said that psi has to be continuous, and that's what made it be v e to the plus or minus kappa x on the two sides initially was b e to the minus cap x on one side, f e to the plus cap x on the other, but they had to match up at the origin, so that meant both coefficients were the same, so we just called it b. And then we looked at the boundary condition on d psi dx, and we decided that because there's a delta function there, d psi dx isn't continuous, it actually jumps across the two sides of the well. You can see that just looking at the picture, those two exponentials meet up at a point, so the derivative makes a sudden jump there. And we decided that the change in the derivative across the origin was equal to minus 2b kappa. And that according to our integration of the Schrodinger equation, that that had to be um, equal to, as well, minus 2m alpha over h bar squared psi at the origin, but psi at the origin is b, and so therefore minus 2b kappa, the jump in the derivative, was minus 2m alpha over h bar squared b, the other expression for the jump, the jump in the derivative. <coughs> this is the jump in the derivative based on the solution we found. This is the jump in the derivative based on integrating the Schrodinger equation. That's an h bar squared there. And so the v's drop out. Sorry. The v's drop out. I usually like the fat chalk over here. Maybe I do like the thin chalk because it's not as ugly somehow. Anyway, the v's drop out. The twos drop out for that matter. <coughs> and so kappa was then m alpha over h bar squared. And then that said that, or not, I'm just going to draw my fingers in the air. So the energy is, the color chalk. Yeah. Try the color chalk, yeah. That's virtually impossible to erase, however, I thought. So there's just no good options here. I could just like cover the whole board in, in eraser and then just draw with my fingers on that. And then my finger would snap, probably. <laughs> you know, 
Actually, I always thought that uh, when I saw you know liquid nitrogen, right? I was thinking like like uh, what would be gross because I don't know my mind works this way. Is you dip your arm in liquid nitrogen and you shatter it all over the table. Uh, why did I think of that? I don't know. Because there's something wrong. I don't know. We're uh, anyway. still recording, by the way. Oh, that's right. You're right. It's recording. Yeah. So hello, future student. <laughs>
comes from the normalization. The normalization sets the amplitude. So let's find D from normalization. So that says 1 is, as always, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the absolute square of psi dx. Add it all up. Not absolute value again, the absolute square. So psi star psi. But our wave function here is real, so psi star psi is just psi squared. So if we do that, then that'll be 2 times, times the absolute square of b. Maybe it's just because I'm such a brute, you know, it's like, it's, it's no chalk can stand up. No, that's ridiculous. Okay, anyway, I'm multiplying by 2 because this function is even, right? And so therefore, so is psi squared. Psi, psi squared is even, so I might as well just integrate over the positive half and double it, because the area is the same from minus infinity to zero as it is from zero to infinity. Uh, what's my argument inside there? Well, the wave function itself is b e to the minus half of x on the left of the origin, b e to the plus half of x on the right of the origin, so psi squared is b squared, e to the 2 cap x, e to the, yeah, e to the 2, uh, two cap x. Did I? Okay, nobody's stopping here. Right? I had to assign the reverse because, because this has to, yeah, oops. Alright, uh, e to the minus 2 cap x, That's the same problem, you know, some, often if you know, tell a bunch of you, you come to me and you're like, where am I making a mistake here? And everything seems so plausible. I don't know. Figure it out. I don't know where your problem is. And, you know, it's like nobody caught me on that because when somebody's doing that, they're like, yeah, sure, that's fine, that's fine. You know, and you don't even see silly things like that. So, anyway, um, well, this is not hard to do. You don't need mathematics for this. Boy, if you use mathematics on this, I'll be putting frowny faces on your face. Oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, I, heard, I was going to mention this. Um, on that homework assignment that I just gave back, um, remember there was the problem, he said, suddenly digressing, remember there was a problem where you were supposed to figure out below what temperature would the electrons in a solid be quantum mechanical, quote unquote. In other words, would you need quantum mechanics to describe your behavior? And a bunch of you said, Below a temperature of, and I don't remember the exact number, but like 129,263 Kelvin or something like that. Can anybody see a problem with telling me that the electrons in a solid will be quantum mechanical below a temperature of 129,263 Kelvin? That's about the Yeah. Because if you tell me it would be, it would be quantum mechanical below 129,263 Kelvin, what you're implying to me is that at 129,262 Kelvin, you need quantum mechanics. But at 129,264 Kelvin, you don't. What? When you're doing this de Broglie wavelength being comparable to the size of the system, that's just a rough estimate. You're just trying to find an order of magnitude kind of estimate of when quantum effects are important. The Broglie wavelength isn't this magic thing, it's just a rough estimate of the characteristic wavelength in the wave packet that describes the system. And there is no sudden transition from classical behavior to quantum behavior. It's a gradual transition. You get close to that temperature and quantum effects start to become more and more important. So, what should you have said, rather than, and you know, and some people said approximately, and I thought, okay, I'll give you some credit for that. I didn't take off for it, but, but how should you report that result? Not 129,263 Kelvin, but like 130,000 Kelvin, or even 100,000 Kelvin, something like that. But um, never give 
five sig figs when you're being asked to make a rough estimate as well. That's six sig figs there, supposedly. Never do that. Never give more than two sig figs when you're supposed to be making a rough estimate of some quantity. Because, you know, I feel like, wow, I need to go have a talk with my colleagues and we'll get together and realize how we fail to impress upon you the importance of knowing when something's just a rough estimate. So from now on, if something is a rough estimate, treat it as such when you report the result. And back to our story. So, I feel better now that I've gotten up. Okay. All right. <laughs> back to our story. Uh, so this is going to be 2 magnitude of b squared over 2 kappa e to the minus 2 kappa x evaluated between infinity and 0. Notice that I flipped the limits because this would have a minus sign when I take any derivative. So I just flipped the limits and made it a plus sign there. And that's pretty easy because on the upper limit, the exponential gives 1. And on the lower limit, the exponential gives 0 because you got e to the minus infinity. So this just turns into absolute square root of b square, absolute square root of b uh, over kappa is equal to 1. And so now we know that b is the square root of kappa, or in other words, it's root m alpha over h bar. So now I have the whole wave function. The amplitude is root m alpha over h bar, and it's e to the minus kappa x, and the energy of it is given in code from that as, e, as minus m alpha squared over 2 h bar squared. Or kappa is m alpha over h bar squared there. So, any questions? So we've completely solved it. The actual finite square well can't be analytically solved like that. That's the reason for doing, part of the reason for doing this delta function square well like this is because um, you can actually solve for the energy in this case. You, as we'll see, you can only get a graphical solution uh, or an approximate numerical solution for the finite square well. One of those kind of surprising things, you know, it's a very simple potential and yet you can't solve for it exactly. I guess if we want to, I might as well put it in my notes, I might as well write it here. So if we want to completely specify then, so what we found is that psi of x is equal to root m alpha over h bar e to the minus m alpha absolute value of x over h bar squared. And then that takes care of whether you're plus or minus, right? On either side of the origin, that works because the absolute value of x is equal to minus x when x is less than 0, and it's equal to x when x is greater than 0. And e, meanwhile, is minus m alpha over h bar squared. So that's the full solution for the single bound state of the finite square of the, uh, of the delta well, of the delta function well. Any Possibility. What if the energy is greater than zero? If the energy is greater than zero, then you don't have a bound state now because the classical kinetic energy would always be positive here. So this is not going to produce a quantum bound state. This would represent a free particle interacting with that potential. So what we're going to consider now are what we call scattering states because we're going to use this as a model of a quantum particle scattering off of this potential. In 280, you may recall that we looked at if you have, uh, say, a, a finite square well type of thing, but you give a positive energy 
and you imagine a wave coming in from the right and partially reflecting and then partially being transmitted through the barrier. That's the kind of situation we're going to look at here. Yes? Where is getting that? Are you getting energy? Um, uh, what is it supposed to be? Alpha squared? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, probably. Is it 2h bar squared? Is it 2h bar squared? I don't know. What did I do? Yeah. Okay. Wow. What the hell did I do? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Thank you. I just made it up. That's where I got it from. I just said, wouldn't it be fun if the energy was... I said, I don't know. Yeah. So for consistency with what I wrote before, yeah. Is it 2H bar? Oh, bloody hell. Let's see. Um, yeah, let's see. So the... Uh, let's figure it out. But the energy was defined to be uh, E psi, heavy psi. We had that kappa squared was minus 2Me over h bar squared. That was the definition of kappa squared. It was minus 2Me over h bar squared. So, the energy would be, uh, the energy then is equal to minus h bar squared kappa squared over 2m. But kappa, we discovered, was what? It's not like I remember, like I remember it. Kappa, we found, was m alpha over h bar squared. So therefore, kappa squared is m squared alpha squared over h bar to the fourth power. So this is minus, I'm just going to be really pedantic here, m uh, h bar squared m squared alpha squared over 2 m h bar to the fourth power. Is that right? So therefore, that will simplify to uh, m h bar squared alpha squared over 2. So it's just supposed to be one factor of m there, which is right. m alpha squared uh, over 2 h bar squared. So, so that is right. This is, what that's, this is, this is correct. Yeah. <coughs> OK, that gets a check. That is actually correct. Yes. I said Yui's not happy. She's happy now. Okay, good. Right, we want her to be happy. All right. Anybody else? Is everybody happy? At least not crying? Okay, good. As long as you're not crying, I'm happy enough at this stage. All right, so. Okay. Anyway, we're going to do scattering states for this potential event. So we're going to look at wave comes in from the right partially reflects, partially transmits. But before we do that, we won't make that assumption, and then we'll throw that in by hand. You'll see what I mean when we get to it. So. Wow, crunchy. Hey, you can see the thread on my shoes nicely here, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, so. greater than zero here, so free particle interacts with well. So, for x less than zero, Schrodinger equation, just like before, says minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi dx squared equals E psi, because the potential is zero for x less than zero. So this says second derivative of psi with respect to x is minus 2me over h bar squared times psi. But now uh, E is greater than zero, so minus 2me over h bar squared is a negative number. When E was less than zero, 
it was saying second derivative is a positive constant times psi, in which case the curvature was going to be away from the axis, it was going to bend away from the axis, but now we're going to get a tricky solution because the second derivative and psi have opposite signs, and that's the situation where the wave function is bending towards the axis. So what we'll do is we'll say that this by definition is minus k squared psi, where this time instead of minus 2 mb over h bar squared, k squared is just plain 2me over h bar squared, which is going to be greater than 0, so that minus k squared is negative. So for positive energies, we get that the second derivative of the wave function is of opposite sign from the psi, instead of the same side like we did for negative energies, same sign. Yeah, what do those do as you go to plus minus infinity? 
The real and the imaginary parts are just cosine kx and sine kx, or cosine kx and minus sine kx. All they do is wiggle. These guys just wiggle, 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 all the way out to minus infinity. So there's no grounds for rejecting either term based on normalizability. Now, in fact, it's not normalizable because psi star psi uh, for either one of these terms would just stay constant. You put an a squared or b squared, and it would blow up. But as we'll see, it's possible to sweep that under the rug because you can normalize them to the Dirac delta function. in terms of neither term blows up. So no reason, no a priori reason to reject either one. No a priori reason to set A or B equal to zero. Unlike when we found the bound state where you had to throw away one term because that term would blow up as you went to minus infinity. Neither of these terms blows up as you go to minus infinity along the x-axis. They both just happily wiggle along. Now again, we have to match up on the two sides of the origin. So one of our conditions, which always holds, no matter what B looks like, is continuity of psi. Psi is a continuous function. Continuity of psi at x equals 0 says, well, what does the left-hand solution, the, the x less than 0 solution, do at x equals 0? What's that turn into? What's e to the ik 0? What's e to the minus ik 0? So this turns into a plus b. a plus b is equal to what happens on the right-hand side. F, same thing, right? So on the other side, it's f plus g. So a plus b equals f plus g. Happiness and joy? <laughs> Not crying at least? Yeah. Oh, you're happy too, right? Yep. Okay, good, happy. Defense happy.
we have that for x greater than 0, uh, the derivative d psi dx is equal to ikf e to the ikx plus minus ikg e to the minus ikx. So this turns into factor out an ik and then have f e to the ikx minus g e to the minus i k x. So the right side derivative, d psi dx at 0 plus, the limit as you come in from positive x, if I plug in x equals 0, then both exponentials, whoops, both exponentials become 1. And so you just get ik times f minus g. So the right side derivative goes to ik times f minus g as you get the origin. For x less than 0, inside the x is equal to ik times, same deal except you let f and g become a and b e to a e to the ikx minus b e to the minus ikx. So that says that d psi dx at 0 minus is equal to ik times a minus b. So from that, we have that the jump in d psi dx, delta d psi dx, the derivative at 0 plus minus the derivative at 0 minus, is equal to just the difference in these two terms, ikf minus g minus ik a minus b. Or in other words, it's equal to ik times f minus g minus a plus b. If I just write them all out. f minus g minus the quantity a minus b, which I've just written as f minus g minus a plus b. And then remember that for our delta well, the condition was that delta d psi dx is related to the value of psi at the origin. Psi at the origin, in this case, is a plus b. Psi is continuous, so it's also f plus g. a plus b equals f plus g, but let's just call it a plus b. We could call it f plus g if we wanted. <clears throat> so this says that delta d psi dx which is ikf minus g minus a plus b is equal to minus 2m alpha over h bar squared psi of 0, but psi of 0 is a plus b. Remember our, our condition was 
delta d psi dx is minus 2m alpha over h bar squared psi evaluated at the origin. Psi evaluated at the origin is a plus b. G to A and B. The other one was A plus B equals F plus G. Okay, by your count, how many equations is that? Two. By your count, how many unknowns are in there? Actually, there's another one too. It's hiding. Beta contains K. Did we ever find out what K was? No. So what we have is two equations in five unknowns. Namely A, B, F, G, and kappa. Uh, not kappa, K this time. Which is the same thing as saying the energy. We don't know the energy. But that's coded for in K. Um, Last time you tried to solve two equations in five unknowns, were you able to come up with a unique solution? Probably not, all right? Um, so, this is an underdetermined system. This is okay, because what we're really saying is that the energy isn't quantized here. There's not enough constraints here for boundary conditions to force you to pick some particular energy. That's why free particles don't have quantized energies, because they're treated as you go to plus and minus infinity, which means you can't throw away, you, you, there's no boundary conditions at infinity to apply. If we had boundary conditions at infinity, that would be two more equations that we could apply, and then we would have four equations in our five unknowns. There's always one unknown that's constrained by normalization, one of the amplitudes would be constrained by normalization, so Boundary conditions at infinity plus normalization would give us the three more equations we needed to solve for everything. But 
We don't have boundary conditions at infinity here. It's the boundary conditions at infinity that would put a restriction on the values of k. But they don't here. And physically, what that means is there's no quantization of the energy here. Any energy works in this circumstance. So without those boundary conditions at infinity, there ain't no quantum in your quantum mechanics. It's, it's continuous, just like classical physics. doesn't mean it behaves classically, but you get continuous energies just like you would in classical physics. Okay. Any questions? Now, we're not done. We're going to say, OK, after the break, well, let's just throw something away.